Good evening. I'm Mike Perry. I'm the president of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, a component of the Army War College at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. The center is the Army's premier research repository with massive collections of archival material, library material, and regulations, general orders, and other authority pubs going back to the American Revolution. Tonight, we are going back to the American Revolution uh, with Colonel retired William Wenger. Uh, Colonel Wenger served more than 42 years in the U.S. Army on active component as a member of the Army Reserve and in the California Army National Guard as an infantryman and airborne ranger. Following military retirement in 2000, he volunteered for four combat tours, two in Iraq and two in Afghanistan. During one of these tours, he served in the assignment of a brigadier general. In civilian life, he is a retired real estate executive and occasional college instructor, primarily at postgraduate level. He earned four masters in theater arts, business, defense management, and U.S. history. He is a graduate of the U.S. Army War College, where he taught for three years and was designated an outstanding alumnus in 2016. That same year, he was designated as distinguished graduate of the American Military University of the American Public University System. We're pleased to uh, come back about 150 years from our last presentation. And Colonel Wenger, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Mike. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor and privilege to be with you this evening to share a bit about my recent book. You can see the title of the book there on your screen. Uh, this uh, larger picture was adapted for the cover of the book. And this picture is by um, Auguste Coudier, painted in 1836. It shows uh, Lieutenant General Rochambeau uh, consulting with General George Washington just prior to the Battle of Yorktown. On the right, you can see the cover of uh, my book, which is on Amazon. Uh, it is provided both in hard copy and digitally. And this is the agenda that we will cover today. We'll talk about why I wrote this book, why it actually ended up be being converted from a thesis to a book, uh, the objectives that I had for the thesis, uh, which ended up in the book for the most part, and I will explain what was removed from the thesis, uh, the limitations of the research, uh, the methodology that I applied to the task. Uh, I want to share with you some interesting facts, some of which you may know, and others I would imagine you really have never heard of before. I will summarize the conclusions as found in the book from my research, and I will share with you some of the scholarly reviews and a summary. You should have plenty of time thereafter for any questions that you might have. So why was the book written? This is a wonderful quote from Voltaire. Uh, and it is a great reminder for all historians that first of all, we should not slander, we should tell the truth. And the second is not to bore. Now you can imagine from the title of my book, that the material in this book uh, could be extraordinarily dry and would be had I not made the effort to try to provide a readable and interesting context uh, for the facts that are presented and then summarized in the, at the final chapter of the book. So why did Americans prevail in the Revolutionary War against the largest and most powerful army in the world, the British. Uh, the American Revolution, <clears throat> as we will talk about a bit as we progress through this presentation, was as you may well know, only a part and not at all that larger part of a larger world war that encompassed, uh, it actually was the First World War, and some historians have called it the Second Hundred Years' War, culminating in the result of the American Revolution and the wider World War, predominantly between uh, British and French forces, 
but also significantly involving Spain, Portugal, Italy, and even India. So how were they, how were the Americans, a ragtag force, a group of colonialists who were uh, largely charged and facilitated and constricted by the British to provide only raw materials and did not have much industry at all. And they certainly at the beginning of the war had no uh, military um, industry to speak of. <clears throat> certainly no military capability, no military force, no Navy, no logistical capability to support a military. They did not have a government who could provide them with proper funding or even proper direction at many times. And so it was amazing that we were, as Americans, able to prevail against uh, the British. But we could not have prevailed, uh, as my book clearly uh, illuminates, if we did not have the distinguished support of the foreign powers that I will speak of a little later in the presentation as to who actually provided that support. Again, predominantly, it came from France, Spain, the Netherlands, uh, and those were the allies, the predominant allies, allied against the British, uh, largely as a derivative of the Seven Years' War and the loss of much of North America by the French, the threat to the Spanish colonies in South America by the Portuguese, in large part supported by the British, the threat to the Caribbean, and the threats to other uh, British colonies uh, throughout the world to include Gibraltar and um, the Kingdom of Mysore in India, which was not a British uh, colony, but was involved in the war uh, as a British ally. And what specifically was the nature of the assistance that was provided to the Americans and why did it make a difference? So the derivation of the book, I have uh, long admired the French for their support to our American Revolution, I first became aware of that support uh, as an undergraduate at the University of California as a history and anthropology major. And I was amazed at the extent to which the French had supported our revolution, although I did not know anywhere near the extent of that support at that time. Parallel with that, as I served with French officers and enlisted in both Iraq and Afghanistan to include a number of gendarmerie working with the police as I was uh, in large part a police advisor as well as an army advisor in both Iraq and Afghanistan, I came to greatly admire the French officers and their enlisted uh, with whom I worked. So, the book evolved over a number of years of my study, working on my a master's in US history, where I wrote and researched a number of articles covering the general aspects of particularly the French, and then began to encroach into the Spanish uh, aid that was provided to the American Revolution. Uh, so I had done quite a bit of writing and research up to the time that I had to determine what my thesis would actually be about. And in fact, I wanted to write the thesis about uh, the larger picture of, of French and uh, Spanish aid to the American Revolution. But my wise advisors uh, said it's way too broad. Much of it has already been written. Uh, you must narrow the research, as I'm sure dozens and dozens of uh, MA candidates have been told. And so I found during my previous research and writing that I had been quite frustrated by the fact that the aid provided by France and Spain had not been 
properly quantified, had been confused, had not been well documented, and had certainly not been converted to any meaningful numbers that would make sense to a, a modern 21st century uh, audience. Um, so as Tony Morrison, whom I'm sure you all know, said that if you uh, know of a book that has not yet been written, uh, which mine certainly was about the quantification of the aid and the nature of the aid provided predominantly by France, uh, you should write it. The derivation, as I said again, uh, my emphasis in US history had uh, been often on military aspects of history, particularly the Civil War and World War II and 20th century warfare uh, of the United States. Uh, but I continued to become increasingly enamored with the founding fathers and their struggle for freedom. Uh, and those gentlemen certainly placed their their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor uh, on the line for all of us. And fortunately, uh, they prevailed. Uh, I continued to increase during my MA studies, my interest in the American Revolution and in the foreign uh, aid that had been provided to make our uh, Revolutionary War a success. Uh, I continued to gain knowledge through writing a number of papers, as I said, about this, uh, and became increasingly frustrated by the lack of detail about the quantification and specifics of the aid to the American Revolution. Obviously, the need to limit the scope of the master's degree thesis was uh, paramount in presenting um, the um, proposal for my thesis. Uh, which also required a significant amount of research and writing to get to that point. And uh, again, I wanted to focus on what I had found missing in the Revolutionary War history. As you all know, Thomas Jefferson was a, a no notorious Francophile, uh, having lived and worked in France as uh, a uh, ambassador for the fledgling United States. And he uh, was highly instrumental uh, in facilitating the capability that was provided to the Americans uh, for their revolution. And even though this quote is my opening quote for the thesis of the book, in fact, as I explain, Jefferson never actually wrote or said this but he said many things similar to it. And I'm sure that if he were alive today, he would say, of course I said that. I wanted to quantify the aid, as I said, by France and their allies, specifically Spain and the Netherlands. Uh, I wanted to uh, create a portion of history that had never been uh, actually documented and thoroughly researched. Uh, I needed to present this in a chronological order uh, because of the progression of the aid over time, as I will uh, explain as we get a little bit more into the details. And I wanted to include as much as possible a comprehensive and intelligible summation of the foreign aid. The limitations that I faced were that the normal length of the thesis for my university was specified, and that university, by the way, was the um, American Military University of the uh, American University, Political University, Public University System, excuse me, the American Public University System. They specified a length of approximately 50 or slightly more pages. My thesis, uh, with the chapter that was excised for the sake of the book, and I will explain that, uh, was over 150 pages. Uh, the length of the book itself is about 130 pages. Uh, the time for the research was also constricted to about seven months, 
But fortunately, I had done a considerable amount of research writing prior to that on much of this subject, but not the specifics of the quantification in the exact nature that I wanted to present it. Uh, and it is pretty obvious that, uh, as I have said many times, and said so in my introductory comments for the book, that because I could not afford to travel to France and Spain to do uh, primary document research, and because of my uh, lack of a reading knowledge of France, a limited reading knowledge of Spanish, uh, and the cost of both the travel and the time to be spent in the foreign countries, as well as hiring translators, uh, I was unable to access what I believe a treasure trove of, uh, of research materials that uh, would otherwise have more thoroughly clarified uh, and detailed uh, the information that I was trying to document. This is a quote from uh, one of my favorite presidents, John Adams, who frankly, I believe without John Adams' vision, foresight, and literal tenacity, we would probably not be an independent nation. Uh, he had so much to do with the passage, the writing and the passage of the Declaration of Independence. I will give you a few moments to read this quote, and then I will talk to a couple of salient points uh, in that quote. Note that Adams talks about the necessity of declaring ourselves independent not necessarily for King George, because King George well knew the uh, animus that existed in much of the colonies of America, uh, the problems that had existed for 10 years, uh, for more than 10 years, uh, following the Seven Years' War known in America as the French and Indian War, uh, that we needed to gain the support as Adams so uh, correctly envisioned the support of uh, France and in particular Spain. And I say, why Spain? Because Spain actually had the money. France was essentially destitute and their treasury broke from the uh, loss of the Seven Years' War. Their fleet was essentially demolished at that time and had to be rebuilt. And in order for France to get itself back on its feet, it borrowed a considerable amount of money from Spain, uh, which caused later problems that led to, in part, the French Revolution. Uh, but Adams knew that we had to have the uh, diplomatic and the economic and probably the military support of France and Spain and the underwriting by the Netherlands, the allies uh, and uh, very diplomatic allies of, uh, of France and Spain because they didn't want to completely alienate the British and the British control of the seas for their commerce. Uh, and you can see in the last thoughts in this quote, the distinct uh, need for American capability for artillery arms, ammunition, flints, uniforms, uh, everything to wage war because we did not have the capability to uh, manufacture those items ourselves, at least at the beginning of the war. We developed it through the war and had a much greater capability at the end of the war. Uh, with our fledgling industry that was being developed, uh, and the same with the gunpowder, which I will highlight in a few minutes. Now, this is a uh, effusive uh, comment 
uh, which I much appreciated uh, by someone that many of you may well uh, recognize, uh, Colonel Jerry D. Morlock, PhD, uh, US Army retired. Uh, Jerry has become a friend and he published two of my articles in Armchair General, which I'm sorry to say is a defunct and very missed um, magazine for me at least, and I know for uh, many of us who uh, treasure uh, military history and uh, those articles that Jerry so well edited as uh, the managing editor of Armchair General. A bit more about the methodology. What I wanted to describe and to document uh, was what was the, the foreign aid in the historical context? What was it uh, in contemporary times? And what is the nature of it as we reflect on it in the 21st century? When was the aid provided specifically, uh, again presented in chronological order, and by whom? How was that aid conveyed to the Americans? Because there is certainly a cost uh, for that conveyance, uh, and there is a necessity to protect that aid from the dominating British fleet that controlled the oceans, uh, at, certainly at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. What was the inclusive cost of the aid to America, which uh, previously had been uh, just sporadically and very poorly documented and not specifically uh, clarified as to what was being accounted for. And then ultimately, I wanted to be able to convert the uh, contemporary currencies uh, into a dollar value that would mean something to us today. And then what impact did uh, this all have on the nations who provided aid to the American Revolution? What you see here is an example of some of the methodology and accounting capability that I used um, to develop a, a detailed accounting of uh, the costs uh, to the foreign powers. Uh, for example, uh, Admiral de Stang's fleet, who supported uh, the, United, uh, the, the United States, uh, because again, the United States did not have a uh, extant fleet at that time, uh, de Stang uh, provided support from 1778 to 1779 for just 18 months. So what I had to do is research to the best of my ability what the cost was for each sailor. Now this of course does not mean just their pay, which was a fraction of the 75 libras you see there, um, but what it did it cost to train, provision them, arm them, and to keep them uh, well on the ships. How many sailors did they have in that particular fleet and in the second major French fleet that so assisted for the Battle of Yorktown? So what was, you had to deter, I had to determine the number of sailors, which took again, a considerable amount of research as to the types of ships, the size of the ships, the manning of ships in those days uh, to determine the numbers of sailors probably involved in this fleet over the 18 months. And of course, some of those sailors died and were replaced. So all of that had to be taken into consideration. So you can see the cost of the uh, Destang fleet for uh, one month. You can see the cost computed for the 18 months. And then for all of these costs, because the French had to borrow money from either the Dutch or from the Spanish uh, at a percentage rate varying between four and 12%. Uh, I took an average of those, uh, the eight PRs and computed uh, the 
cost of that money. So that's how the 16 million libraries was derived. So you can see there's a lot of research and a lot of assumptions that had to be made to arrive at these figures. Next, you can see that uh, the foreign aid for the American Revolution for the year of 1778 um, was summarized and annotated uh, for the 18 months for the fleet. The total cost was computed. Notes are provided as much as possible, describing how the money was, uh, the costs were derived, and the same for Spain. And then those were totaled for each year. Now, I had to break down, as I said, the costs per ship, per man, uh, per type of ship uh, for uh, D'Estang's fleet. That took a considerable amount of research using a number of naval scholars, Jonathan, Jonathan Dole being one of the best that I found. And uh, his estimates of the cost to maintain a single sailor, uh, to build a ship, uh, to man a ship of the various types. Uh, and I computed then, as you can see in the fifth column, uh, to from the left to the right, that I did not consider that the full cost of the ship should be part of the equation, that I took the useful life of the ship and cut it in half uh, for that amount of usage that could be logically dedicated uh, to the American Revolution effort. And then again, the loan costs, uh, if 80% of the money had been borrowed for those costs, and you can see at the bottom uh, the grand cost that I determined for Admiral Destang's fleet. And a lot of this actually uh, came not only from John Dull, uh, but the quantifications came from the journals of Destang himself. Here you can see the uh, total for 1777 as uh, delineated by each company who provided uh, country who provided support. Uh, you can see the dates as best I could determine them uh, for the contributions made. Uh, remember that uh, some of this cash was a loan. Some of the cash were grants, as you can see in the third column from the left. Some of the uh, supplies and military uh, Equipment was provided at the cost of the French, but was not well documented. You can see in the middle of the page that I, uh, for France and Spain, for the military hardware, and in particular for the gunpowder, uh, of which 80 to 90% of the gunpowder used in the revolution was provided by France. And I had to figure out what was the cost and value of that gunpowder, which changed over time as the Americans became more adept at creating their own gunpowder uh, as opposed to importing uh, gunpowder. So the value of the gunpowder increased uh, over the years of the revolution. And you can see that I summarized the costs for both France and Spain in the various cash and currencies uh, contemporary at the time. No attempt was made by year to convert the currencies to uh, modern uh, dollar equivalencies. That was done uh, at the end of the process during the summary and conclusions. The picture you see here is of the Battle of Brandywine in 1777, the year uh, for which this table applies. At the end of the book, there is a uh, summarizing uh, appendix, which in chronological order, to the best of my ability, with applicable notes, summarizes the uh, aid provided both in material and in cash in various currencies of France, Spain, the Netherlands, uh, what was provided to the uh, Americans, to prosecute the war. And you can see the grand totals at the bottom 
which were then taken and through extensive forensic accounting uh, were then converted uh, to uh, modern dollar amounts first of uh, that of uh, 2010. And then I will give you the dollar amounts for 2021 to give you a little updated figure. Again, I mentioned to you that uh, an astonishing amount of the gunpowder used by uh, the American forces during uh, the revolution was provided by European countries. We did begin to develop capability within the colonies to produce our own gunpowder, but it was even severely limited by the time of the end of the war, uh, which essentially ended in uh, 1781, but was not concluded by treaty until 1783. Uh, the French minister to Congress, who was a strong supporter of uh, the uh, American cause, uh, personally guaranteed a loan to buy food for Washington's starving army at Morristown, without which uh, the war would have been over uh, for uh, the Americans. And the picture that you see here is of uh, the soldiers at Morristown, which by all accounts was a much worse winter, as I think you know, than that of Valley Forge. Although, in the last point, although GDP is a 20th century concept through forensic accounting, the best that can be determined by that accounting and by the documentation that I found that for the fledgling years of the, uh, the Continental Congress uh, governed America until the uh, Constitutional uh, Congress in 1787, uh, consummated in 1789, that during that decade, uh, based on the estimates of gross domestic product for uh, the new nation of the United States, the total aid from France and Spain would have totaled 20 years of GDP. Uh, Beaumarchais, who is the playwright mentioned here, who wrote The Barber of Seville, The Marriage of Figaro. He was an inventor, an intriguer, a courtier. Um, he was uh, highly instrumental in uh, convincing Louis XVI to support of the war in the United States uh, through uh, Beaumarchais efforts facilitated by a number of uh, American ambassadors to include Ben Franklin. Uh, he created a, a fictitious and shadow a shell company uh, to uh, facilitate the passage of uh, a considerable amount of cash and supplies uh, through Spain uh, to the Caribbean, to neutral ports in the Caribbean. And then a lot of it was brought into uh, the United States, both through uh, coastal ports uh, from Rhode Island to Charleston, but a lot of it was also brought up through uh, New Orleans, uh, controlled then by the Spanish who were obviously allies of the French at that time. A number of French engineers were highly instrumental in supporting uh, the efforts of the American Revolution and were essentially, uh, were essential uh, to uh, such actions as the emplacements at Dorchester Heights, the success in Boston, the success in Charleston, and um, the certainly the success as well as uh, the uh, use of the heavy, heavy cannon provided by the French fleet uh, for the success of the siege of the Battle of Yorktown, without which, of course, the Battle of Yorktown certainly could not have been won by the Americans. Uh, there were 9,000 Americans, there were roughly the same amount of French, uh, but the French fleet was, of course, extraordinarily key to blocking the reinforcements of the smaller force of about 7,000 
uh, for Cornwallis bottled up in the small town of Yorktown. By the way, uh, it is little known that uh, the uh, French suffered more casualties in the Battle of Yorktown than did the Americans. Uh, the French suffered uh, 35 to 50 percent more KIA than did the Americans. And oftentimes it's very difficult to determine how many French sailors were also killed in fending off the uh, British supply ships uh, and their protective fleet trying to come in to reinforce Cornwallis, which of course they were unable to do due to the French efforts and uh, thereby facilitating the uh, American and French uh, victory at Yorktown. Here are just a few of the quotes by uh, a number of scholars who have become friends as a result of my thesis and book and who were highly instrumental in uh, providing information that I relied on to research uh, the book and to help me. Uh, they also helped me clarify the facts of the book, particularly Larry D. Ferrario, uh, who teaches at uh, uh, George Mason University, <clears throat> his former military and secret service, a um, engineering and U.S. history scholar uh, and a, an extraordinary gentleman who wrote to me, wrote in 19, uh, 2016, what I consider to be the definitive uh, work on the overall subject of the uh, French and Spanish aid uh, to the American Revolution, the Brothers of Arms, American independence, the men of France and Spain who saved it, for which Larry was nominated uh, for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, a number of these other uh, scholars, including Stephen Conway, who incidentally is British, uh, had good things to say about the book. And I will tell you now, it was also uh, Larry Ferrario who told me to take out a 35 page chapter that was in the thesis, uh, which was a required um, uh, element uh, which was a massive historiography to prove that I knew where I got my information and that it was reliable. Uh, and he, Larry, sagely said, people don't want to read about what other people said about your subject. They want to read about what you wanted uh, to present. And it was gentlemen like these, uh, as well as my thesis committee, who said, you really need to publish this uh, thesis as a book, because it needs to be a reference piece uh, for scholars and to be used in teaching. And uh, actually, a couple of my uh, history uh, professor friends have actually used the thesis in its original form and now use the book um, for uh, secondary reference material uh, for their students. Conclusions of the thesis and the book uh, of the aid provided by France, Spain, and the Netherlands. There were direct grants that were never intended to be paid off, that were gifts to the Americans. Uh, and there were also loans. Uh, many of those loans were engineered very adroitly uh, by the great businessmen at the Netherlands banks. I interestingly enough, both France and Spain uh, were unable over time to uh, actually be paid back much of what they had loaned to the United States. Some of it was paid back as late as 1830 with pennies on the dollar, um, but there was a lot of resistance, particularly by Hamilton, to pay off the, the debts to France and Spain. But somehow, some way, the Netherlands came out of this very clean and actually made money on the investment on the American Revolution. Uh, at least they uh, did not lose money in the process. 
uh, what were the material logistical contributions? Uh, what was the cost and extent of the direct military assistance? And I would add that that all of these costs were calculated and carefully annotated to make sure that it, I was accounting only for the aid to the American Revolution and not to the larger world war. Now, the last bullet, sub bullet in this direct, indirect military assistance alludes to such things as the assistance that General Galvez uh, gave the French governor of Louisiana uh, and a military uh, uh, actually genius who eventually was one of eight individuals granted citizenship by the fledgling United States, only eight have ever been so granted citizenship for his incredible aid to our revolution. Uh, just a couple of the things that he did, uh, he prosecuted a uh, war against the British, the British fleet uh, with the Spanish uh, fleet and cap military capability in the Caribbean, which was a hot spot of the war, which uh, also pulled a lot of, of military capability away from the pressure on the Americans. He provided significant uh, military contributions in what was not then the colonies of the United States, in Florida, in Mobile, in what is now Alabama, and in Galveston, in Texas, uh, where he drew British forces and capability, and in fact, cost of warfare away from the effort to fight the Americans, thereby giving significant indirect assistance uh, to the American cause, again, causing the British to find that the American Revolution was simply not worth the effort for them, particularly with the extraordinary loss due to piracy on the high seas by American um, uh, pirates given um, the capability to um, raid British merchantmen and use the neutral the, the ports of France and Netherlands to hide their efforts and to replenish. Uh, and the um, British, therefore, the public became very disillusioned with the American Revolution. Uh, they could not stand the financial loss that was being imposed on them. Lloyds of London, who insured the cargoes uh, going to and from the New World, uh, again, as victims of a extensive piracy by the Americans and by other um, allied nations, uh, caused the merchants in London uh, to pressure Parliament and King George uh, to wind down and to emphasize the effort of the American Revolution. Finally, the computations uh, that took so much time and effort to uh, put together resulted in my uh, knowledgeable and uh, uh, constructed uh, total contribution of aid of all types from France of $69 billion in 2010 dollars and 16 billion uh, from Spain. Converting those to dollars for 2021, it's about 82 billion from France and 20 billion from Spain. Again, Netherlands essentially broke even. Sweden, while providing about 70, some estimate a little over 100, uh, soldiers of fortune, uh, King Gustav sent them there to gain military knowledge and experience, um, and they contributed uh, honorably and in some cases significantly. For example, uh, one of the major aide-de-camps to Rochambeau at uh, Yorktown was a noted Swedish officer. Uh, but as far as the, the monetary contributions of Sweden, they were negligible and not computed in this study.
Larry Ferrario, again, uh, very sagely uh, summarized, summarized uh, what I had found uh, in all of my uh, diligent effort uh, in that America could never have won the war without France. And France could never have succeeded as broke as they were from the Seven Years' War uh, to have provided the aid they did, both in cash and militarily, without the Spanish uh, currency, which was in large part derived from the riches of the New World in gold and silver. I worked diligently to compute the final cost uh, value of the foreign aid as conservatively as is reasonably possible. And I uh, put a footnote in the conclusions that stated that despite my best efforts, uh, the conclusions that I have reached, 69 billion and the 16 billion, could be as much as 30% uh, underestimated. This picture is of the final leg of Washington's 680 mile march from Rhode Island in the north, obviously to um, Yorktown for the Battle of Yorktown. And they're passing through Williamsburg, Virginia and Rochambeau did a similar uh, route march, which is, uh, was historic and in, an enormous uh, accomplishment. Uh, and is long remembered and in fact there's an association to which I am now an active member commemorating and studying uh, and reenacting in some cases uh, that historic uh, march. Subject to your questions, this concludes my presentation and I'll be glad to take questions in the chat or in any other form. We have uh, questions already from uh, uh, one individual, but it's two questions. Uh, First question looks at uh, why was France and Spain left out of negotiations of the Treaty of Paris? Why did we do this and how did Franklin explain this to France to smooth things over? It's my understanding that France was a little in disarray politically at the time of the Treaty of Paris and that they were not entirely left out of the negotiations. Uh, they were included, but in the previous picture that I showed you, you can see the American delegation uh, to the Treaty of Paris, uh, but the blotch on the right-hand side was the British uh, contingent who refused to be uh, painted into the picture. Uh, Franklin, I'm sure, found a constructive way to soothe uh, France's egos about all of this, and to assure them that they would be made whole uh, for their uh, investment uh, and contributions to the revolution. Okay. Another question for Robert, was there inflation or recession in these European countries that might have changed the total cost in US dollars? And can you elaborate a little bit? Well, we'll go with that one first. The, uh, there was inflation uh, throughout the Revolutionary War, the currencies continued to fluctuate uh, throughout the war, and I had to end up taking averages of the values of the currencies, as did a number of other uh, more experienced uh, uh, and more knowledgeable forensic accounting folks that I consulted about this. Uh, the uh, it, it's almost like nailing jello to the wall to try to convert currency from uh, the American revolutionary period to current dollars. Um, in, in the inflation uh, side of the situation in the revolution was uh, relatively modest uh, relative to the uh, significant fluctuation in the valuation of currencies one against another. The primary currency of the time uh, was uh, Spanish reals, uh, even over the British pound of the time. Netherlands 
um, Netherlands provided the banking and facilitated the movement of the monies from the coffers of Spain through their banks uh, to be then loaned to the French. It was a highly convoluted system, uh, but these uh, Netherlanders were able to uh, engineer it in such a way as, again, as I said, they came out uh, essentially whole after the smoke cleared from the revolution. This uh, question is from Richard. Uh, the recent production of Ken Burns about the life of Benjamin Franklin made extensive reference to the aid provided by France. Did you uh, watch any of that uh, series and would you evaluate the accuracy if you did? Unfortunately, I have not been able to see that uh, uh, series. Um, I look forward to viewing it, um, but I would imagine that the documentation that Burns has done is probably uh, quite accurate. And there is much more uh, through, through this process and through the publication of my book, I have um, developed a number of uh, allies uh, in the uh, foreign uh, academic community who corroborated, as I said, uh, my belief that I'd only scratched the surface of what is available um, in secondary sources with some availability of primary sources, as I alluded to, uh, such as the journals of some of the French admirals. Uh, but there is a treasure trove of information. A friend of mine, uh, Dr. Iris DeRode, who has written a, a stellar book that's going to be published next year at the University of Virginia. It's already out in France in French about a uh, major general that she has significantly researched for uh, in his library, she found over 4,000 documents uh, detailing the logistical contributions uh, to the American Revolution, accounting for them in a detail that I have never been able to find in any of the sources that I only had seven months to research. And later on, she found another Major General, who had been the primary logistician uh, for Rochambeau uh, up to and including the uh, siege of Yorktown. And his, uh, in his uh, estate at his castle, she found over four, 500 documents uh, in portfolios actually, uh, detailing very specifically, almost day to day, what it cost Rochambeau to support his army. And from that, we can interpret uh, what it cost Washington to support his. And as you may know, um, Yorktown would never have happened had not first uh, uh, Dalbez provided money to Rochambeau and Rochambeau out of his own pocket, provided uh, 2 million liveries which then became the funding which allowed Washington to pay his long delayed salaries to his soldiers who were about to desert just prior to Yorktown and to keep them with him uh, for the success of that battle. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? We'll wait about a couple seconds here if someone else has questions. Okay, here we go. I see a fourth. I see. Again from Robert. Uh, what was the name of the French playwright who aided the American Revolution? You uh, you had that as a highlight, but uh, he missed it. Yeah, Beaumarchais, who wrote The Marriage of Figaro, um, The Barber of Seville, and a number of other uh, a number of other uh, outstanding uh, works. Uh, again, he was a courtier. He was an inventor. He was a watchmaker. Uh, he was a patriot. Uh, he was a strong advocate for the American cause. And later on, to his misfortune, he became an advocate uh, during the French Revolution. Uh, and he got a bit on the wrong side of that, that uh, struggle. Okay, we got uh, Richard again. Uh, in the current political climate, any delineation of the American heritage and history is wi widely disparaged. Do you consider your work to dilute, uh, 
work to dilute in any way the heritage of American founders by giving credit to foreigners? No, not at all. I think that uh, it showed an amazing capability by a fledgling nation to put together a delegation to go to France uh, to include Ben Franklin, uh, to uh, advocate to Louis XVI and his court uh, for their assistance, both monetary and military. Uh, and I don't think it diminishes them at all. It's also to the great credit of the Frenchman that I mentioned, that uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, de Rode has researched, uh, who were both uh, significant friends of Washington uh, and worked closely with Washington and supported uh, the American cause. There was a great symbiosis uh, by the American leadership and that of the French, uh, which uh, obviously was um, most typically characterized by the service of Lafayette, uh, as we have all learned many times over our history. I do not think that any of those relationships uh, diminish in any way the uh, credit or character or capability of the Americans. I think it actually adds to their credit uh, and their uh, frankly, their ambassadorial capability to get the support they needed from, um, from France and also from Spain. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you for tonight's presentation. Uh, Bill, do you have anything in closing? No, again, I would just echo the words of Larry Ferrario uh, that uh, we could not have won our revolution and our independence uh, without France. And surprising to many Americans, the French could never have succeeded without the significant monetary and in fact, even indirect military support of Galvez and the Spanish. Okay, well, well thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, interesting presentation and and uh, one doesn't get into finances very often uh, when we look at warfare. We look at operations, we, we look at leadership, but, but getting into the financing and the logistical support provided is, is, is critical. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I'd like to invite everybody back in, in two weeks on June 15th at 7 p.m. Uh, James Kitfield is gonna talk uh, about in the company of heroes, inspiring stories of Medal Honor recipients from Afghanistan and Iraq. It's gonna take us about another 225 years forward, what Bill was talking about, uh, but that's the pleasure of hosting these series as we get to, uh, to navigate all of American history. So again, thank you, Bill, for tonight. Thank you for those who joined us. Please let folks know about the lecture. We'll be posting it up on YouTube in a day or two and uh, let your friends know about what we, uh, we heard tonight. So again, good night and thank you.